Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Real Estate Live UK. And uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, for this session where, we, where we'll be talking about building garden communities. Now, the Real Estate Live UK programme takes place three times a year and is brought to you by White Label, our partners and our sponsors. And for this edition, we're moving away from the usual fully virtual programme as we head to Liverpool tomorrow for an exclusive in-person investor roadshow. But don't worry if you're not in Liverpool. um, The main plenary sessions will be available to watch online, as always, for free. Um, And just before we we get underway, we'd like to thank all the organisations contributing to the panels we've got taking place this week. Now, places across the UK will be showcasing themselves to investors and developers, and industry-leading experts will be exploring ideas on how the property and regeneration sectors can continue to thrive as we discuss the programme's key topics, which include free ports, the rise of the industrial and logistics sector, and the role of culture in creating and sustaining communities. Now, you can find more about Real Estate Live by visiting our website, which is realestatelive.co.uk. But right now, uh, we're heading into our building garden community discussion, where we'll be talking about how to embed culture in a new community. Now, this is an ongoing programme delivered by by White Label. And this session follows a great live one-day conference that took place in May uh, in Reba, London. And visit the website for more info on that, which is gardencommunities.co.uk. Now, just before we start, I'd like to remind everybody uh, watching us uh, live, do do please feel free to ask questions using the Zoom's Q&A function, and hopefully we can get some really great interactive debate and discussion going in the next hour. And for now, I'm pleased to hand over to our chair for this session, Max Farrell, founder and CEO, LDN Collective. Over to you, Max. Thanks, Catherine, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and welcome to this uh, really important and, and topical session, um, which will be exploring culture as, as a key component of any new and, and indeed any existing community. But today, particularly looking at new settlements and, and how and ensuring that those communities thrive. Um, we all know that successful places have to be environmentally and uh, socially sustainable and have a strong sense of identity and and shared values. So uh, as well as having the all important space for creative industries to to grow and to prosper. Um, And these things are absolutely critical to plan for proactively from the outset. Um, So my name is Max Farrell. I'm chief exec of the LDN Collective. Uh, We're we're a group of about 50 members who have different skill sets uh, in built environment and collaborate on projects with a strong social and environmental agenda. So we're currently master planning new garden communities in uh, Oxfordshire, uh, Huntingdonshire and and Solihull, as well as health and wellbeing facilities uh, in the Southeast and urban regeneration projects in the North of England, which is where I'm calling in from now. Um, I also chair the board advising on cultural co-location for Creative Estuary, uh, and where we have two pilot projects, one of whom is represented here today in terms of Ebbsfleet uh, in Kent and also Purfleet in in Essex. Uh, We we have an excellent panel today, and and we're going to hear from each of them their views about this topic. Um, And we're going to hear first from Stuart Sapford, who is the um, Executive Director of Communities, Culture and Heritage for the Letchworth Heritage Foundation and also the chair of the Letchworth Culture Committee. And one of the things he's done there is to lead a team of partners to create the Garden City's first ever cultural strategy. So I will um, turn to uh, Stuart first and then afterwards we will open it up and we'll have a, a Q&A. And please do um, put your questions in on, on the Q&A and um, we have a great panel to answer them. So, so Stuart, um, the question that um, I'd like to put to you today is how, how has Letchworth adapted its cultural offer as it's developed as one of the more established garden cities? Sure, thank you, Max, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. 
Um, I, I think the first thing to, to focus on really is the, the fact that we're the, we're the world's first garden city. So a, a new town that was built around an arts and crafts movement. So culture was very much at the heart of, of our establishment, of our creation. Um, we, were, we had ambitions around being a pioneer in town, about enabling people to express themselves, to bring arts, heritage, culture um, and expressiveness to the, to the town. And, and those principles still remain within the town. Um, we, we have a wide range of cultural activities. We've got a uh, massive list of partners and individuals, uh, both from a very kind of amateur level of, of interest uh, through to some, some professional opportunities, through our arts galleries, through museums, through uh, ceramic studios and other things like that. Um, and also we deliver a, a, a series of programmes ourselves and buildings. So we have a museum celebrating uh, the past 120 years we have a collection and an archive and we have an art gallery. Uh, and I think that the thing that we learn, and it's a familiar story for all of us through uh, the last couple of years and the impact of COVID was we needed to bring partners together. Our funding certainly took a hit. We fund our services through the income we generate from our property portfolio. Uh, many of you will be aware that that will have been affected over the past couple of years. So we needed to think creatively. Uh, and it really gave us an opportunity to think about how we could generate strength in partnership and to be able to elevate the offer that we currently had, but to rethink our arts and crafts uh, a kind of history and heritage and consider what culture means for us for the next 120 years, uh, starting firstly just with the next five because 120 felt uh, a little too ambitious. Uh, so taking the next five, uh, the co community and its partners have come together uh, and we formed a culture committee, as you said. Uh, and within that group, we've created 14 key objectives. And I'd encourage people to take a look at it. I won't go through it now. But really what we were trying to do is to think, how do we take the principles of the Garden City and what we've achieved over the past 120 years? And how do we reframe them and make them modern uh, and allow us to project them now? Uh, and really what we're trying to do is two key objectives. Firstly, is make us known for our cultural offer. There's so much to celebrate, but there's so much that's hidden. There's, there's almost an underbelly of arts and crafts and heritage activities activities that we really need to raise to the service and shout about. But also, how do we engage people that are disengaged at present? That's a real consideration for us. So we've got a strong focus now on audience and audience development, community being at the heart of what we deliver, considering the benefits of arts and heritage for individuals, for the town, for people's personal well-being. So we're now engaging families and, and community partners that work with families and children. We're engaging schools much more effectively, but we're also engaging businesses and other community groups, those that uh, possibly yet to realise the benefits of arts and heritage and culture uh, and working with them to try and help them understand how collaboratively we can achieve our, our, our ambitions uh, and our aims together. So creating links, uh, understanding where the community is, at and trying to, to do this really through consultation, understanding what the town wants, understanding the partners. Um, we've got a real opportunity as well through the local plan that many of you will be aware of. Uh, we're now in the process of looking at development of a further 14, 1300 homes in the town uh, and arts and culture very much sit at the heart of that. So culture strategy comes at a right time and it's a really exciting time for us to develop and, and build on what we've, we've got in the past. Great. Thanks, Stuart. Um, lots going on, clearly. And um, uh, interesting now to, to, to follow on from that in terms of uh, Ebbsfleet, because I, I know that they have taken a lot of lessons from, from Letchworth. And, and, I, and I, I, I think I'm right in saying that the, 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 their Garden City Trust that they've established recently is the first since Letchworth. And, and that whole idea of stewardship and making sure that, that there's a legacy and an ongoing dialogue with with the community and uh, is is absolutely key. But let's, so let's hear from Laura Bailey next. Um, Laura is the cultural development manager at Ebbsfleet Development Corporation, one of the um, government's uh, development corporations overseeing this major project. Um, and she's been driving the whole uh, cultural placemaking agenda and has secured over uh, 1.2 million pounds through partnerships. Uh, which has the aim of supporting the development of cultural infrastructure and, and they are doing some great things there. So, Laura, um, it'd be good to sort of know from you what Ebbsfleet has done to date uh, to, to embed culture and how this has been working out and, and what the ambition is moving forward. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, so we, we are following in the footsteps of Letchworth um, and learning from the original garden cities. We're the largest of the new garden communities, um, I think the first of 100 years. Um, so we, there's a lot, a lot to learn from, um, but a lot to sort of trial as well, because, you know, we're sort of, um, there isn't really a blueprint for how to build garden communities now, I think. So, um, you know, we are trying out new things and new ways of working. Um, so I've been there since 2018. Um, and the, one of the first things that I did was actually to commission a culture strategy. Um, with support from Arts Council England um, because we felt it was really important to have a framework to work to and also um, you know a, a sort of document that supports the work that we're doing that we can put in front of funders and other people to show that we're really serious about this um, and that has three key priorities um, so the first one is around co-locating cultural facilities in some of the planned infrastructure so we felt it was important to try and embed culture in as many places as possible we didn't want to go down the route of pinning our hopes on one big arts facility you know maybe in 10 or 20 years time we wanted to make sure or try to make sure that the arts and culture were part of people's everyday lives right from the start so from those early pioneering residents who move into a you know, a construction site essentially is how can we get them involved in culture and creativity that starts to build community right from the beginning. Um, so we, in terms of cultural facilities, we are looking at things like community centres, parks, a new health and wellbeing hub, schools, that sort of thing. And what, how can we embed culture into those facilities that we know are coming? We are also looking at some specialist culture facilities later down the line. And we've been going through various co-design and engagement processes to understand what it is that people need and want from culture facilities, right from sort of grassroots um, community organisations, individual residents, through to creative and cultural organisations of a, a larger scale. Um, the second um, priority is around um, community-led cultural programming. And this is really fundamental to the way that we're working at Ebsolete because it needs to come from the people that are living there. You know, the, the programming that I might commission needs to fulfill their interests and their aspirations and their desires. So we're, we're sort of balancing a curated and a community led approach. Um, and we've been doing this partly with support and investment from the Cultural Development Fund, which was um, which is DCMS funding via Arts Council. Uh, so we're part of a programme in Kent and Essex called Creative Estuary. Um, and we're just on to our fourth commission um, through that programme, which is all about community led cultural programming. So we've just kicked off a programme called the Creative Exchange, which is very much putting um, communities in the driving seat of cultural programming and working in partnership with creative professionals to create pop-up events and projects um, across the year that are based around their aspirations and their interests and that's going to include some training and some um, skills development and we're also kick-starting a culture forum which will be ongoing for people to engage to, to drive a, a cultural agenda essentially um, and then one other programme that I wanted to mention was um, a young people's placemaking programme. So we're really trying to encourage the next generation of young creative minds to get involved in creative playmaking, to start thinking about the design of their spaces and places. So we're working with an arts organisation called Cement Fields on that. Um, and they are looking at the moment at the design of some of our major parks. Um, and open spaces and thinking about what it is they want and need in those spaces and then sort of drilling down into some really detailed design work. And they're asking really big questions about, you know, how do you design a city and what does a future city need in, the, in order to be successful and to be sustainable and, you know, to have great community cohesion and things like that. And then in terms of how it's worked, um, I, I mean, I go back to what I said at the beginning, really, it's, it's, it is kind of trial and error. 
you know, working with communities, particularly new communities who are not established yet, is not an exact science. So you have to have a go at things and then you learn from them and then you reflect that in the next thing that you do. And everything you do has to sort of um, has to reflect the aspirations and interests of all these new people, new residents that are moving in all the time. You know, every week and month and year, there's a whole load of new people who might have other ideas and other cultural interests and, you know, from different backgrounds. And so it's it's a flexible and ever changing process in order to engage communities in culture. But I think, you know, the fundamental part of it is really that it is about it is about the people and you know we all know culture can really support people in feeling a part of a place and help drive the economy supports people's health and well-being so that's the kind of broad approach that we're taking is to try and really galvanize and utilize culture to support a whole place agenda Okay, great. Thanks, Laura. Um, uh, lots to, to think about and uh, to talk about there when we get into a discussion. And um, I'm going to move on now to um, uh, Holly uh, Holly Howitt, who is the um, uh, Marketing Communications Manager at Wilmot Dixon. And, and Holly's worked on a number of projects ranging from residential-led developments to schools and leisure centres. And she's also currently doing a Master's in Sustainable Planning. Um, so Holly, um, from your point of view, how important is the design and development of housing and the sort of community hubs that Laura was talking about and enabling this um, creation of a, a cultural offer? Thanks, Max. Um, and afternoon, everyone. Um, so I think, you know, the design and planning elements of it is kind of vitally important because it's sort of the blueprint of where we either go in the right or wrong direction in most instances. Um, you know, when we see things at the moment where we're having kind of budget cuts across the across the kind of different platforms, often cultural and arts venues are a lot of the first places to unfortunately get cut. And what that means is that more people are left in their homes with little to do and no way to engage with their wider community. There were some surveys done throughout COVID and, and it assessed that about 3 million people in the UK felt lonely or isolated, despite the fact there were some kind of already enabled community hubs, but perhaps not enough of them or perhaps people didn't know how to engage with them. And I think it's up to us as kind of developers and customers to make sure that developments are inclusive as possible, especially during that master planning stage. Um, we were going through the process of buying a house last year. And I think every time we found a house that ticked all the boxes, the first thing we did was what's its proximity to shops? What's its proximity to the pub? You know, all those areas that you think when you're moving to a new area or a new community, how do you envisage yourself living in that space outside of when you're just going to, to sit and watch TV and, and kind of go to bed at night? Um and I think that's something that we maybe overlook because we're kind of considering on on the housing rather than actually the overall master plan of the development in some instances. Um, and I think if we can make developments more accessible and, and diverse, it will embed a variety of culture and not just kind of a single instance of that. We visited as part of my course a, um, a development a few months ago. And as part of the covenants of the development, they don't encourage white vans to be parked anywhere on the estate, not on your driveway, not on the roads. And although, you know, whatever rationale was behind that, I think intentionally or unintentionally, there's a bit of a segregation of the market there that if you are a white van driver, you now no longer feel that you're perhaps welcome in that community. Um, and what we've ended up with is then there is a very siloed mentality to the type of people who should live in these types of communities. And that's for us, I think, as developments developers to, as we go through that kind of engagement and consultation stage, if those ideas or propositions come through, it's for us to explore alternatives and move kind of people away from that because we want them to be as engaged and, and as kind of diverse as possible. We don't want things like covenants there as barriers for people to, to start to enjoy and engage with communities. Um, I think there have been some really positive changes with policy where we started to move away from the model of where developers can offset housing, affordable housing on other sites and so we end up with kind of a split segregation of different type of housing and with the installation of the new sill payments if we can see more of those monies spent locally then people can really feel the direct benefit of their engagement through the new communities going up around them or the ones that they hope to move into and become a part of um 
And I think Laura mentioned a few of these. If we can start to consider cultural opportunities outside of just kind of community hubs and parks, but actually arts venues, you know, there are these and venues that can kind of switch from day to night, things that can engo- engage with people across the wide spectrum of ages and demographics. Because I think too often, you know, developers, we can just tr- go down the nuanced route of we just need a park that has some play equipment or we just need a community hall and that therefore serves everything that we need to to provide. Um, but it maybe doesn't leave the legacy or opportunity for communities that we'd hope. Um, and I think kind of finally, we, you know, we're all kind of very aware of the, the rising kind of challenges around carbon and, and the climate emergency if we can provide these opportunities for people to engage culturally within the development boundary it prevents the need for people to get in their cars and drive elsewhere and ultimately encourage that that actually you have these opportunities on your doorstep so people are more likely to just stay locally and in doing so you know get to know your neighbours get to know the reasons why you want to live there. Um, great points, Holly. And uh, I think it's it's in some ways people are, are, are understand better what's involved in, in being environmentally sustainable now. Yeah. But the whole idea of being socially sustainable, I think, is is less well understood. And and you're absolutely right that good good places uh, have diverse the diversity of demographics and appeal to different age groups and ethnicities and physical abilities. And 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 you know that all needs to be planned for from the outset in order for cultural to be a culturally rich place Absolutely. um and so i'm just going to turn now to our final uh, panel member who's uh, hazel edwards um and hazel is the uh, southeast area director for the arts council england um and she has led the delivery of the let's create a 10-year strategy across the southeast and also strategic investment to make impact for the arts from Brighton to Cambridge, a wide area, uh, and working with um, grassroots organisations as well as cultural icons. So uh, good, looking forward to hearing more about that and the work you've been doing, Hazel. Um, and in particular, I suppose the question that I wanted to ask was, how, how do organisations like the Arts Council work with garden communities to, to help develop this um, cultural strategies that we've heard um, uh, 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 about so far? Okay, thanks very much for your generous introduction and good afternoon, everybody. I think we've got a, nearly 60 people online, so it's a testament to the interest there is in this subject. Um, and also very nice to meet fellow panel members. Um, and I've heard several of you name check Arts Council already, Arts Council England. I've been working for Arts Council for about 16 months now. Um, and we're a national development agency for museums, libraries and the arts. Um, but as I speak, I'll sort of reveal a bit more about the organisation if you don't know it. So garden communities are a vision of, of a good life that is available to all places that allow individuals and communities to flourish. And that vision has often um, been seen primarily about the physical environment. I think we heard that from Stuart. Um, and it's true that Ebenezer Howard, who's the urban planner and founder of the garden city movement, um, his aspirations were about combining the best aspects of the town with the best aspects of the countryside. However, as we've heard from Stuart, there's lots of elements to the garden city movement that connects this vision with our aspiration at Arts Council. Um, And that's particularly around the desire to develop creative communities. And um, Max, you referenced our Let's Create strategy, which we launched January 2020. Um, And we've got three critical outcomes for that, creative communities being one, um, but also creative people and creative nation. Um, But this strategy is quite different to previous strategies, and it's really dialing up place-based cultural development. Um, Ebenezer Howard um, wanted to see the value retained in the community, and with that value ploughed back into civic infrastructure for the benefit of local people, and he wanted a rich cultural life to be part of that. And today, the case for culture to make places better has, I think, been accepted both at local and central government. Um, and I think it's true to say that this, we've actually arrived at a point where there's cross-party consensus around this and, and the levelling up um, for cult, the levelling up um, white paper really demonstrated that. And actually, Arts Council was at, at mentioned in that paper, which we were really pleased to see. Um, culture and creativity can have a deep lasting effect on places and people who live in them, including creating opportunities for people in new and developing communities to engage with culture. Um, and you can see it happening in a whole variety of ways so it creates civic pride and and shared local identity local identity it makes places 
um, that people want to live and work in. It makes them more attractive and it leverages in investment and skilled workers. It helps high street renewal with cultural organisations, act, often acting as um, anchor institutions, which is really important. It tr attracts people to support the nighttime and the tourist economies and often reorientating retail that's suffering so much to that important or be all all important experience economy. It gives people positive opportunities, promoting social mobility um, for children and young people, as well as cohesive communities where people from different backgrounds might come and mix together in a cultural venue. And finally, it supports local prosperity, growing, for example, the tourist economy, especially improving productivity through overcoming seasonality. Um, and as we've heard already, underpinning the development of creative industry clusters. So there's massive um, gains to be made from embedding arts and culture in um, these new uh, garden communities. So what role can Arts Council play and similar organisations? Well, I can, I'll can. i just speak to Arts Council at this point. Um, we can galvanise around four of our main functions. So we invest, we invest um, large sums of money, money every year on behalf of government and also national lottery. Um, we invest in both fixed term projects, but also on a longer term basis. Um, so we have a number of organisations at the moment, 800 organisations that we um, invest on a three to four year basis. Um, we also have a, a powerful role to play in convening um, catalyzing partnerships, bringing people together. And we're increasingly have a role to play in development. So our staff are working around building capacity in, in place um, and building capacity in, in, in a very hyper-local way often. And finally, we do research and we collect data and we share best practice and we, we produce reports. So that can obviously often sort of be um, a gathering point for moving the discussion on and moving um, policy on. So there would be an, there, there is an opportunity in the Q and A to return to some of these activities in more detail um, for Arts Council if you're interested. But finally, on behalf of Arts Council England, um, I want to say that we really welcome the ambition of new garden communities to be truly creative places, putting cultural opportunity at the heart of their plans for the future. And I was really pleased um, when I visited Ebbsfleet earlier this year to hear from Laura and her colleagues about what they've already achieved and what they're planning to do in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Hazel. And um, good, good to hear more about the work that, that you're doing at Arts Council. And again, just would encourage anyone to um, ask a question in, in, in the Q&A box if, if you um, want to sort of discuss or find out more about anything that you've heard so far. Um, but I suppose I'll, I'll try and kick off the conversation. Um, and what, one of the things you mentioned there, um, Hazel, was about sort of creative clusters. And it's quite interesting uh, to, to think about sort of mapping and, and auditing uh, what's already going on. Uh, uh, there was a, a good report recently. It was by the Creative In Industries Policy Centre, and it was around rural creative clusters. And it had a, a and it showed them and the size of them and where they are located around the country, and and so often quite surprising. And 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 I think that it's kind of building on the ecosystems that already exist is is really important, and encouraging and nurturing and sort of creating the conditions for these types of. A whole different myriad of different types of creative industries um, because there are so many and they're all very different whether it's sort of more screen based like film and gaming or or, or, or the you know the performing arts or, or the fine arts and uh, but essentially all like the idea of co-location too but but it's also another issue is is around developers and and, and local authorities understanding the value of the creative industries in, in, in a wider sense and, and there was a great um, uh, report uh, recently that was um, led by uh, C Creative Estuary um, uh, and others, which was around the value of residential properties, uh, which have creative space and, and affordable workspace co-located within them and, and actually something like four or five percent higher than the value of another yeah. typical property in a similar situation. So that kind of piece of empirical evidence is often quite useful for encouraging those that are financing and developing new developments uh, to, to, to think about this type of thing from the outset. But um, so that was quite a long-winded way of saying how, how can we sort of 
learn from and tap into what's already going on in, uh, within surrounding communities, but also make sure they're involved in the development of these new communities. So maybe Hazel, you might want to kick off and then we can just anyone else that wants to chip in. Oh, you're on mute, Hazel. Sorry about that. We did talk yeah. earlier on about having two and yeah, a half to practice this, <laughs> and I still get it wrong, so I do apologise to everybody. Um, I've just wanted, we've mentioned all of us, I think, creative estuary, um, and we do have Emma Wilcox, who leads that project, um, at the part of the audience, and she's just posted a link, so if anybody's interested in creative estuary, it's there. Um, so uh, how do you build on existing um uh, cultural sort of activity. So I think um, one of the important things um, to say is that it's, it's that point that um, Laura made um, so well. Is is it's really important to take in to take into account and to co-create with local communities when you're doing this sort of planning. Um, and, uh, and and I think the fact that we helped invest invest in a, a strategy which um absolutely um, put together but very much with in partnership with local communities and also with um local creatives and we've got um an existing um scheme that's over 10 years old called creative people and places so if you're interested in looking at that um you can go online and and um look we've got nine of those in the southeast area at various different points of maturity um one actually based in Medway that interacts with the Creative Estuary Project. Uh, and it's it's a very sort of tried and tested way of working from a sort of grassroots up um, in, in developing um, cultural infrastructure and program um, in places that hitherto haven't really enjoyed either investment or cultural infrastructure. And we're often working with sort of non-traditional partners, um, perhaps in the health sector, local authority partners. So that's that's one route. Um, you talked about the importance of um, creative industries and um, definitely you know, the support that you can give and the embedding of um, studio space and space where people can co-locate because that critical mass is absolutely, um, uh, you know, vital to the to the flourishing of creative industries. Um, that is a really good place to start. And there's some interesting um, models for making that happen, including the land trust model. So that may be something that people want to do a bit of research. And then I, the, the final thing I wanted to say is that, um, which I alluded to in my introduction, is the importance of sort of town centre and, and also high street revival. And a lot of the big government funds like Stronger Towns, Leveling Up Fund, one already in train, Leveling Up Fund 2, which is people are, are just working on now, um, and we're going to be commenting on um, the, the role that arts and culture can play in, in that town centre and high street revival is really important. And working with a different set of partners that we might, you know, not have worked with before um, is, is critical there. So I will just say that to kick off that discussion. Thanks, Hazel. That's good, good points. And did anyone else want to cover that um, or, or chip in? Is it? Interesting you mentioned town centres and high streets, because I think that is also a critical uh, issue in terms of how much has changed in the last couple of years even, and how it's no longer about relying on retail and shopping to, to create footfall. It's actually about community and, and how do you create that sense of community and whether that's within the public realm or, you know, programming uh, it's space, but also having um, uh, the sort of... Um, places for spontaneous interactivity that that, that you need uh, in order to develop that sense of community. But um, Laura, do you want to come in? Yeah, I was just going to add that, you know, it is really challenging with where you have surrounding neighbourhoods of, you know, how do you engage with them when, you know, they're the ones who are sort of having to bear the brunt of often really large scale um, disruption really for a very prolonged period of time and so it is really important to to go to where they are and, and, and actually often in the early stages of development when you don't have your new community centres yet the venues that you might want to host activities like cultural activities in are within those surrounding communities so that's a really great opportunity actually to to get that you know to work directly with them to bring new residents into those surrounding neighborhoods 
Um, and then obviously once the infrastructure starts to develop in your new development, then, then you, you know, you can tr bring up existing residents into those new facilities and make them feel like they're for them as well. But somebody asked in the chat about what was like a go to sort of activity for, you know, engaging um, residents, I think, in, in new communities. And, and my answer to that wouldn't be some anything really specific, but a um, 100 percent like something participatory. It doesn't really matter whether what kind of creative activity it is, but what you want to do is facilitate people talking to each other. And for for you who are work, working in that environment to be able to talk to people and find out what they're interested in. So rather than something audience based, something really participatory. And actually, I know this is something Arts Council doesn't fund, but but food is such a great place to start with with people, you know, like it's it's you know something that people can express themselves through they can um you know bring their culture to the table you know it's something we all do we can all talk about so that's just my one little um suggestion on that thanks laura yeah and uh, absolutely agree with you about about food and and it's it's interesting isn't it because quite often these things are uh, with new communities it's also about a, a, a different way of living now that, that we have to sort of start to embrace whether that's sort of living more locally in terms of how we get around or also sort of um uh, growing food and and and, and um, more locally and, and more seasonally and, and 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 so on but these are all really important things so i think with a new community people have the opportunity to buy into and and and, and sort of embrace and um, so we've a couple more questions now in the, in in the, from the from the audience. So um, one from James Mark, which is uh, some, somewhat of a philosophical question, but I think it's a good one because he's asking um, whether you believe that the panel believes that community drives culture or that culture drives community. Um, so that's one to just maybe have a think about. But maybe I'll combine that with um, the other another question which is um, what is the best way to engage with existing and new communities at the same time to ensure there's no them and us when, when uh, providing opportunities? And, and, and I think that's also a really important issue around sort of integration uh, and, um, and, and, and not sort of polarisation. So um, does, who wants to pick up on either one of those questions? Anybody? I'll kick off, um, Max, yeah. if you want. Um, so actually, James, you've mentioned a point that I was going to touch upon in my uh, my opening bit, actually, because we often have this debate internally on is culture a top down or a bottom up kind of approach? Because often you don't know what the culture of a development is going to be until ultimately it's delivered and people move in and it, you end up having a nature nurture kind of debate on. I think what our responsibility is, is to provide the, the facilitation and the infrastructure for culture to evolve and to grow from that. But we only have a steer and understanding if we can actually foresee what kind of development we want it to be. So, for example, if we want it to be more sustainable, we want a culture of people who are going to kind of hopefully really embrace those sustainable kind of principles. We need to make it car free. We need to put public transport at the forefront. We need to include allotments. We need to make it kind of, you know, almost impossible for people to deviate away from that. And then ultimately you will probably only find the people who move towards that development are people who share those values and those principles and want to live those in their daily lives. So I think there's a way for us to kind of, if a development has a very clear purpose, we can kind of sculpt it in such a way, but trying to engage with the wider communities that sit around that, that perhaps are, are juxtaposed against what those principles are, how we make sure that we're not just kind of shoehorning into what is an already embedded culture is really challenging. Um, and I think probably the most important, important area for us is to, to understand actually what is the way to, to communicate with those individuals. I think um, London Borough of Brent did a really brilliant um, job of this, actually, when they were going through a regeneration scheme. I think they tr did the tried and tested, let's open up and have people come down and share their views. And they weren't getting any engagement. And it was really important to have the buy-in. And so they commissioned um, a local rap artist called George the Poet, um, who maybe you know, Lucy rap, but um, and he pulled together all of their engagement material because it was the 
language and, and the way that those people were engaging with each other, he could tap into that market. And he was essentially their conduit to be able to then engage with them because they decided to change the approach to suit the market or to suit the demographic. Um, and ultimately, the, the regeneration then took a completely different journey because suddenly their conversation started. Um, so I think in the first instance, we need to do an assessment of the audience to make sure that our one size fits all approach actually isn't appropriate. Yeah, I think that's that's a really interesting point because actually it's, it's, it's about that's about thinking more creatively about communicating with people and and, and mm-hmm. different ways of doing that and not just sticking to the tried and tested sort of typical methods and you know so much more now is done online in terms of engagement as well as face to face and and that reaches different audiences often often younger people who often uh, and, and different demographics and, and and who often have more positive things to say about new development but aren't typically the people that that get involved in in those types of uh, engagement processes so that's that's a, that's a really interesting point um anyone else Stuart did you want to sort of t- um come in there and talk about your experience of uh, yeah, I'd, I'd originally I put my hand up. I took it down again. Holly gave the perfect answer for me. Uh, you know, engagement is absolutely the key, and and you know, I guess we have kind of the opposite issue in that we we're we're an established garden city, so um, we're not creating new communities, but we've got new people coming into communities. And I think what we've done is just take things back a step. So we've looked at audience engagement and audience development plans, and we've actually created a series of personas for. Uh, different parts of our communities to help us to understand their motivations, their ways of interaction, how they use media, social media, how they engage with community, how how they uh, how they spend their free time, um, and that's been really helpful for us to to understand them. And I think that the the bit beyond that, and I won't repeat what Holly said, is just about how we engage with them, how we understand, how we put them at the centre. As I was saying earlier. Uh, community being the focus so I think going right the way back to the question I think it is a a bit of both you have to create a framework uh, to operate within but you have to listen to your community about what they want and understand that communities is changing all the time so make that live give them the opportunities as well I think within an established garden city as I said at the start we've got um, I keep calling it an underbelly there needs to be a better word for it but we really have a hidden cultural movement um, and what we're trying to do is to create the platform for them to be able to become more ambassadorial give them opportunity to create social action social change and, and to lead and to drive through the skills and the experience that they have uh, but we can only do that if we give them the platform to operate and we we ask them to come out and join us uh, as, as part of this kind of movement interesting and that so i suppose you're both sort of talking about things needing to be more bottom up and and, and actually um, creating the right conditions for, for that to happen, which I think is absolutely key. And then it's kind of, you know, not, not having one definition of what culture is, because it means different things to, to different people. Uh, it's about, you know, um, I, I love the, someone mentioned the London Borough of Brent, and I love their their slogan when they were London Borough of Culture it was actually London Borough of Cultures, and 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 I thought that it, that in itself was was quite um, sort of uh, thought provoking. But um, I'm going to ask. There's there's quite a specific question from somebody here in the audience. So from Joanna Hill um, for um, uh, for for you, Hazel, and that's and Joanna's from Uttlesford District Council, who are preparing a new local plan, and it requires all new development to adhere to garden city principles and is likely to have a new settlement. Um, it's, it's a rural district and it's conducted a baseline assessment of culture, creativity and the arts with the view to developing the uh, cultural strategy. So the question then is, what is the Arts Council doing to support planning departments in local authorities to develop these cultural strategies? Um, which Joanna has pointed out is important to leverage SIL, the community infrastructure levy, uh, and, and also contributions from developers. So uh, is that something you can you know, perhaps help uh, uh, reply to, Hazel? Yeah. So we have organised our team in the southeast around um, place. So we do have key staff who will be working in Essex, so that's number one. We can put you in touch with those people, although I um, have to say at this point, it's quite difficult because we're all working on assessing um, our applications for those big organisations that will receive um, three year funding. Um, so we're looking, we're assessing those applications at the moment. So just 
have a bit of patience with us um, uh, to, to respond to any queries. But we also do have a toolkit, I think it's online, um, on how to write a cultural strategy, uh, which is tested over time. Um, if it's not available online, then, then I can certainly send you a link. And there, there are also quite a few consultants out there who can support that work around creating a strategy. Um, I would also suggest that you could look at an alternative to a cultural strategy, and that's something called a cultural compact. Um, and we have supported a lot of those um, across the country. And basically, it's a compact between a variety of stakeholders in place um, about developing uh, cultural infrastructure and programming and so on. Um, and sometimes if, you, if you're... Um, in a place that's quite advanced on on cultural development, a cultural compact is is possibly more useful because you're tying people down to certain commitments around um, going forward. And um, quite often, it's used if there's a, a university partner in that mix um, because they they quite like that sort of commitment, memorandums and understanding, and so on. Um, so I think yeah, that's that's my suggestion. Interact with us. Um, have a look online for those. Uh, cultural strategy toolkits and have it um, and also perhaps talk with us about potential consultants who can support a cultural strategy and I, and I do know Uttlesford I think that's um, the district council that includes Saffron Walden um, and you've got quite a fine cultural offer already that I'm familiar with so good to hear from you Joanna. Great stuff. Thanks, Hazel. And if, if you are able to um, or have some, any time to put the link in the chat, that would be good. But otherwise, it would be good to hear more about the cultural compacts. I hadn't actually heard about those. So that would be interesting to find out what's involved, because often it's the the collaborations between the different different partners that is the tricky part in terms of, you know, you mentioned universities and, and local authorities working collaboratively with sort of um, government bodies like like yourselves is, is, is absolutely key. Um, so just there's, there's a few more questions here. Um, so one is uh, from Laura Jane Lovell, who's asked, um, how can communities better engage young people? So teenagers or people in their early 20s, for example, and make sure their experiences and ideas shape future decisions and it's not just tokenism, um, which, I mean, Stuart, you mentioned this sort of underground movement uh, 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 in Letchworth, which is interesting. And, and I'm uh, guessing that that is also very led by, uh, has it young people or? Uh, well, I'm unfortunately not, but um, no? I, I can wind to an answer on it because we're, we're trying to address it at the moment. So we've, We've actually got, if you look at our demographics, we've got uh, the highest number of or percentage of over 65s anywhere in Hertfordshire uh, and a very high number in, in the local region. So um, we've got a, a lot of active uh, retired people within the community, um, which brings certain types of activity and certain nuances to activity. So as part of our audience development work, we've been looking at how we engage these younger audiences uh, and give them the opportunity, empower them to, to take on activities and, and to deliver. And, and actually, until probably 18 months ago, there's very little for young people to do in the town. Um, we, we're quite unfortunate as well because of that. A lot of people leave the town when they go to university in their late teens, early 20s and don't return again until they have a family late 30s, early 40s. Um, so that tells us a lot about the opportunity that exists in the town or the lack of opportunity that exists for that, for that cohort. So we're actually, as part of the Culture Committee, we've created a, a subcommittee, a, a young people subcommittee. So they now, we're meeting again with them in a couple of months, they're now being empowered to give us ideas and, and we'll try and find a way of giving them some budget and some opportunities to lead activities. We're delivering young curators programs. We're giving opportunities to, to young people to start to express themselves and give them the platform to perform. Music was something that was missing for a long time as well. We've got a local group that have come in and are supporting to mentor and coach uh, young musician, musicians in the town. So there's lots of things that are happening, but, but we're still a long way off of having the, the answer to it other than, as I said before, creating the platform creating the resources for them to be able to to express themselves great thanks Stuart um, I think we've not got too much time left now so what I think uh, it'd be good to do is to ask a, 
a closing question for for each of the panel members and and to go around and 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 give you the chance to 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 give your thoughts and reflections also based on the discussion that we've had today um so that closing question um is uh if you just bear with me a second find it so what well, it, it is got quite a broad one so it's uh, what why do you think culture is so important within a garden community or a new settlement and uh i think well, let's take it in um the uh reverse order that that people uh spoke originally so hazel what do you want to kick off on that So I, yeah, I think I mean it's all, it's really what I've said already, and it's been a sort of golden thread running through what everybody else has said. And I think it's the power of culture to bring people together um, with lots of different backgrounds um, and to animate the space that they work, they live and work in, um, and for that to be self-sustaining. Um, so what the you know the generation generating the, the good out of the cultural. Um, uh, activity and and bringing people together that that good is sort of ploughed back into the community rather than taken away and exported to other places in the country so it's a sort of a circle um uh going forward thanks hazel um and uh so uh, holly do you want to um go next yeah, absolutely um i think it's important to just adopt a model that sees our communities naturally grow and evolve in a sustainable fashion. So um, there's a really lovely example down in Poundbury, where I think at first it was a little bit of a model village. But since then, as the communities have through subsequent phases, it's responded and evolved to what people actually need it to deliver phase by phase, rather than necessarily sticking true to the outline master plan. Um, and as you know, as we evolve as a kind of as a community wider than just where we live, we need to look at areas the way that we can support each other in our well being in all of those different areas including sustainability and if we have a community that can naturally respond to that I think the the need to engage in all of those other kind of council-led initiatives becomes less so and it becomes a community-owned and community-focused initiative and um, we ultimately just become kind of a peerage less so neighbours um, so yeah I think just having something like that that's self-sustaining is kind of as Hazel alluded to it is really the primary goal. Thanks, Holly. And when we were having the uh, the chat just before the event, uh, you, you mentioned, and without putting you on the spot about naming any names, but you mentioned examples that of where it isn't done well and, and what the outcomes are then. And I wondered whether that would be something just interesting to touch on. Yeah, well, I think in in areas where, where, where kind of culture hasn't been considered or, or a singular culture has been in, in considered in, in its independence, I think we end up with segregation. And ultimately, you then see that there is, as kind of someone mentioned in the chat, the us and them mentality, because ultimately, you find almost a divide of services, you find that all of these things have a natural implication upon funding cuts within local authorities, because people won't go to certain areas, and therefore certain bus routes are cut, because ultimately, they're only best there to serve people that utilise them. But if the culture prevents people from feeling that they can go to certain areas all of a sudden we have a completely different kind of approach to how that funding is allocated and then all of a sudden we have an ostracized community who are left to their own devices and and it just perpetuates the problem so yeah i think if it needs to be at the forefront of every kind of decision making in order for there to be successful integration between new and old communities primarily Right. And, and as Emma Wilcox has said in the chat, that, that having that constant iteration of your plan, planning and, and being adaptable and flexible, as Laura was saying uh, uh, before, uh, learning as you go is it's absolutely key as well, isn't it? And um, having the right resources and people to, to be able to do that uh, uh, at the same time. So, Laura, uh, do you want to just uh, cover that final point and your, your reflections? Thank you. I think really it's just because culture supports this whole place agenda that, you know, I mentioned earlier, and this is kind of what we've been talking about. You know, it's a driver for economic growth, you know, creates jobs. It supports people's health and well-being. It absolutely supports community cohesion, you know, and the, and the you know, feeling of belonging and identity for a place, um, you know, so it, it's really important that people understand that culture really contributes right across all of these agendas and supports them. But also that culture in and of itself is just makes people happy and is a brilliant thing 
you know, to have in your life. And so why would you not want to put that into a into a new place? If you think about if anyone thinks about anywhere they've ever been in the world on holiday, like what were the things that you saw and did there that made you have a great time? And probably it's the culture and the arts offer and the heritage and those sorts of things. So it's it's a no brainer, really. That's my <laughs> concluding statement. A good concluding statement. Um, thanks, Laura. And um, and then just uh, finally um, uh, over to you, Stuart. I noticed there's quite a lot of uh, comments in the chat which I haven't touched on around sort of moving away from car dependency, which I think would need a whole seminar on its own uh, to to really properly cover that. But obviously, it, it, but it's part of that wider narrative about change and about embracing change and it being for the you know for the good of the the planet and for, and for the community too and whether it's car dependency or uh some of the other things that we've talked about but so Stuart over to you yeah I mean they've not left me much left I mean some brilliant summary statements there um for me it really is place making is culture and culture is place making i think that's what it boils down to and um, i i still think you know i'm i feel like a bit of a fraud i'm not necessarily from the cultural sector i've come in a few years ago um and and kind of bought experience from other sectors but i really believe in the benefit it brings to the town and i think the narrative of the past couple of years hazel you touched on it earlier about how culture can support communities out of the pandemic it can support town centers as we see some of the retail offers decline it really holds the key to a lot of what we do but i think the kind of reflection for me that i often come back to is sometimes the word culture can be a barrier sometimes that can stop people from engaging sometimes people don't want to be told they're engaging with an arts offer or a heritage offer or a cultural offer so somehow we need to continue to work to break down these barriers in communities and speak the language that that they speak one of the one of the concluding statements we had had as a culture committee when we were producing or finalizing our culture strategy was should we really just call it a things to do strategy because that better connected with our communities so I think the final word for me is listen properly to the communities. What do they want and how do you use this as a tool to be able to engage them and to create create place locally? Great. Thanks, Stuart. Really, really good uh, insights. And uh, I absolutely agree. It should be a connector, not a barrier. And I like the idea of a things to do uh, uh, and, and also a sort of means to express as well, because that's ultimately what it's all about too, isn't it? Having the ability for people to express themselves freely and openly and in different ways. So um, I think that's been a brilliant, brilliant conversation and um, lots of points that we couldn't actually cover, but um, perhaps we'll have another rerun uh, in the future. But Catherine, and uh, over to you to, to wrap up. Great. Thank you very much, Max, and to everybody um, for taking part today. And we will indeed be carrying on this conversation and theme, as I mentioned at the start of the session, through the uh, Garden Communities channel that we have, gardencommunities.co.uk. So watch this space for more updates on that. Uh, we have a lot going on still uh, as part of Real Estate Live um, for the next three days. We have one more session um, this afternoon, uh, which is all about generating footfall. And I know that we have a very, very large number of people signed up to tune into that one. It's a very, very hot topic uh, and a very important topic as well. So we'll be closing uh, today with that session. Um, and then uh, just a reminder that tomorrow we are physically in Liverpool. Uh, for those people who are in the, in the area, uh, we are running um, three sessions, which are also being transmitted virtually online. Um, so the first session is Liverpool City Region, Home of Science and Innovation. Uh, and then we're going to be talking or, talking about London cities, regions, inclusive communities. Um, and then uh, another session, uh, attracting creative and digital tech talent to the region. Uh, and at that point, um, our delegation will be jumping on some buses and having a, an actual physical tour. Uh, and I'm sorry for anybody uh, watching virtually, that's the one bit that we can't actually uh, bring you virtually, I'm afraid. But um, there's more also also on Thursday. Um, uh, so lots and lots uh, going on. And that's a quick update there of what's happening on Thursday. A reminder that if you've missed any of these sessions, um, they, are all, they will all be available online to watch um, at the end of the week or maybe even before then. And all these sessions 
are free uh, for everyone uh, to watch uh, at, at your leisure. So as I say, just a final thank you to everybody uh, for watching, to all of our panels and to Max for chairing um, what is uh, a very, very interesting discussion. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. But for now, goodbye.